Es war ein König in Thule. War treu wie Sand das Grab, dem Sterben seine Buhle, einen goldenen Becher in Greek mythology, the War of the Titans was a 10-year series of battles which were fought between two camps of deities long before the existence of mankind, the Titans of Atlantis and the Olympians, who had come to reign on Mount Olympus. This Titanomachia is also known as the Battle of the Titans, Battle of Gods, or just the Titan War, and was fought to decide who would become the rulers. Und als er kam zu sterben, zählt er seine Städte im Reich. Greeks of the classical age knew of several poems about the war between the gods and many of the titans. The dominant one, and the one that survived, is the theogony attributed to Hesiod. The stage for this important battle was set after the youngest titan, Kronos, overthrew his own father, Uranus, with the help of his mother, Gaia. Kronos took his father's throne after dispatching him, then secured his power by re-imprisoning his siblings. After freeing his siblings, Zeus led them in rebellion against the titans. Zeus then waged war against his father with his brothers and sisters as allies. He also released the Cyclops from the Earth, where they had been imprisoned by Kronos, and the Cyclops forged for Zeus his iconic thunder and lightning. Fighting on the other side, allied with Kronos, were the other Titans, with the important exception of Prometheus, who allied with Zeus. Atlas was an important leader on the side of Kronos. The war lasted 10 years, but eventually Zeus and the other Olympians won. And the Titans were imprisoned in Tartarus. In the Iliad, Zeus asserts that Tartarus is, and I quote, as far beneath Hades as heaven is above earth. While according to Greek mythology, the realm of Hades is the place of the dead Tartarus also has a number of inhabitants. Atlas was given the special punishment of holding up the sky. We think of Atlantis as an island, probably somewhere in the Atlantic, and probably about in the location of the present Azores Islands. But actually, Atlantis was a diffusion. To have a map of Atlantis, as it was in the time of its glory, you would have to have a map of the entire planet because it was a distribution. Continents rose and fell. Islands came up and went down. Great land shifts occurred. Plato refers to the mysterious empire as Atlantis. He probably received this name or secured it from Solon who in turn had received it from the priests of the Egyptian temple at Sais. Now the word Atlantis, or its root, is not Egyptian and it is not Greek. No one seems to be able to trace the origin of the name. It appears on two very important phases of ancient mythology, Atlantis and Atlas. And the root is A-T-L, Atal. Now if we look to find the language, in which that word or that root is permissible or was used, we find we'd have to come to the Western Hemisphere because Atto was one of the month names of the Mayas. It also has more than just a name significance. Its glyph or its symbol is a deluge. This seems then to give us the real basis of our word. According to Plato, at a remote time, the gods of High Olympus, 
distributed the world to their various sub-deities. And to Poseidon was given the lands of the sea, the great oceans, the islands, the archipelagos. And Poseidon created his kingdom in the oceans. These islands came together to form a league. And this league, in turn, created a kind of empire. And in the course of ages, the princes of the islands of the Atlantides uh, became very proud. They decided that they would conquer the world. So in order to achieve this great end, they decided to send expeditions of conquest over all the other parts of the then Atlantean distribution. Now this distribution at that time uh, consisted, much as it does today, of countries of various degrees of development. It was not an uninhabited world. The Atlanteans were not the only people. But these other people were comparatively primitive. They were like the natives of Africa or the natives of some Polynesian area or perhaps the natives of some distant islands of the South Pacific. They were primitive people, but they existed. And the Atlantean merchants went to them, tra traded with them, and bartered with them. Plato states definitely that Atlantis had a great mercantile, that it traveled to all parts of the world, that it even visited Europe and as far south as South America. These princes decided, near the end of their time, to invade what uh, is now Europe. They decided to invade uh, in the areas of the Mediterranean, North Africa, and the Near East. So they sent great fleets to conquer these countries. countries. In the meantime, the deities, uh, particularly Poseidon, realizing what was occurring, gave warnings and sent prophets and told these people they were destroying themselves, but they were proud and they gave no mind or no thought to consequence. And finally, they rebelled against the gods and the gods reacted accordingly. In a single night, the great center of Atlantean culture, the island of Posidonis, the last surviving fragment of an ancient order of life, disappeared under the ocean and, according to the Maya calendar, carried with it to death 60 million human beings. The people of Chaldea and Babylonia were very primitive. They had no laws to live by and no governments except tribal communes. And in the midst of all this time, while they were living along the shores of the sea, one day something strange happened. A being came out of the sea. This being whom they called Alanis had the body of a fish and the head of a human being. And this man who came out of the sea had scales. Now scales could very well represent armor. He carried symbols with him. And he was a good man. And he came to these people. And he taught them. He gave them a written language. He gave them the knowledge of agriculture. He taught them astronomy and the mystery of the stars. He helped them to build a permanent government, introduced them into the mysteries of architecture and the building of cities. And he also taught them the mysteries of heaven and the ways of the gods and taught them to live in obedience. And he told them that in due time he would return. And then he went back to the sea, promising to come back one of these days, sometime in the, near, in the future. And he walked out into the sea and disappeared. Now this seems to me to be a veiled story, could be a veiled story, of an Atlantean traveler, a missionary perhaps, who came to these people, this one who came out of the sea, he dressed in armor, probably came on a ship which came over the horizon and was regarded as evidence that he came out of the sea. The most important thing, I think, in this legend is that he promised to return. So they waited. And they kept his laws and they kept his rules for years. But he never came back. 
Now, these stories are interesting. There's nothing you can do but remember these strange stories. The same story exists in China. In China, the world's reformation, the restoration of humanity was the result of a mysterious being who came out of a fish's mouth and rising out of the sea taught them the secrets of life. In India, Vishnu, in his first incarnation, is born from the fish's mouth. Everywhere the, the sea was the source of instruction. Something came from the sea. We can't dogmatize what it is, but it is interesting that at a remote period, certainly eight or ten thousand years ago, if not more, doctrines and concepts and beliefs reached all parts of the world and are still reserved and preserved in all the mythologies, legends, and allegories of ancient peoples, recognized as the ultimate source of civilization. Now, if these were missionaries, travelers, philanthropists from the Atlantean Empire, they might have wished to come back. They might have said that they would, or that others would follow. And then came the deluge. The center of the great wheel was destroyed. No one could come back. Little by little, these peoples in different areas modified their beliefs. Interracial minglings brought about complications of stories concerning the descent of knowledge. I think if we follow all of the traditions that exist, we would summarize the highest terminal aspect of Atlantean culture as a very high culture, with scientific knowledge, with good map making, with many types of industry, arts and sciences, accredited as having the first to domesticate the horse, with hospitals and clinics, and with various types of locomotion, and according to the old stories, the Atlanteans had the secret of flying through the air. We can doubt all these things. We don't know for certain. But we do know that there was on this planet at least 12, 15, 50,000 years ago that there was a great civilization. One of the Hindu scriptures says, referring to the earth, the great mother has shaken many civilizations from her back. And maybe Atlantis was one of them. Maybe Lemuria was another, perhaps Hyperborea was another, but in any event, far back, there were forms of life and culture very different from what we have today. If in a more ancient time, most of the planet consisted of comparatively primitive peoples, most people living in other parts of the planet would have no knowledge of it. Or if they had a knowledge, it would only be a legend. And perhaps the legend is responsible for another series of interesting beliefs. The World Mountain, Olympus, uh, Asgard of the Nordic peoples, the whole series of the demigods, the demigods who walked with men, the individuals who had apparently supreme power, in which a higher cultured civilization moved in on the primitive one and was mistaken for gods until they proved that instead of being gods, they were ravishers of the earth. So, in that type of thinking, we might also find a source for much of our religious thinking. These mysterious priests of the serpent of the city of the sun, these priests were undoubtedly wise in the mysteries of life. The ancient rites and mysteries of the Greeks and Romans and Egyptians, the secret and esoteric teachings that have descended to us from unknown antiquity, may very well have originated among the esotericists of Atlantis. There also seems to be quite a little evidence to the effect that when the great decision was made, and the gods decreed that the Atlanteans had destroyed themselves 
and must be removed from the earth. That prophets arose among them in those last days before the end. And these prophets warned them, warned the people. And these prophets led certain groups of the Atlanteans away from Atlantis and into what is now Europe and the Near East. These peoples survived. If this migration occurred at least twelve to 15,000 years ago, we have some suspicion that many of the civilizations of the Near East, and perhaps even of the Far East, originated among these transplanted peoples who had gone away from the cause of death. It is stated in the Atlantic story that a great number of the gods of Egypt were, uh, we'll say, refugees from Atlantis. That the uh, gods of the Egyptians were Atlantean deities who originally, perhaps, actually and physically lived as leaders of their peoples. In any event, the idea that the world was populated, in one sense, by refugees is not uh, unreasonable. And many of them settled and mingled with the peoples of these areas to form some of these wonderful and mysterious civilizations which we have no real explanation for. We have very little explanation for how racial differentiation in recent times came about. Uh, the uh, various anthropologists and so forth have charts showing what happened. But as is the case in mo most of science, <coughs> no one seems to know how it happened or why it happened. Is it true that a civilization existed long ago which knew what we do not know today? Is there something lost in our way of life because it disappeared under the waters of the Atlantic so far back in our story. Is it true that there were giants upon the earth in those days that had skills and abilities uh, which they had derived from the studies of esoteric matters? Did black magic originate in Atlantis? It probably did according to the Platonic uh, discussion because it was in Atlantis that for the first time man disobeyed the gods. And from disobedience fell the angel. In the last few years, there's been a great deal of emphasis upon extraterrestrials visiting our planet. These Greek stories of the Titan War fall into a class of similar myths throughout Europe and the Near East, where one generation of a race or a group of gods, by and large, opposes the dominant one, often the parent civilization. Sometimes the elder gods are supplanted, sometimes the rebel gods lose and are either cast out of power entirely or incorporated into the existing pantheon. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an independent anthropologist. I would like to thank you for listening and sharing if you enjoyed the video. Of course, giving a thumbs up will help me out, as will a thoughtful comment, which I do read, even though I'm unfortunately not able to reply like I would like to. I appreciate the donations some of you have made to Atlantean Gardens, the nonprofit organization that publishes my books, even if you cannot make a donation, I'm honored to be able to share my research with you and I'm very grateful for the open minds and the encouragement I get out there to continue making these videos. So please leave a request in the comment section if you have one. Thanks again. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you next time. Oh